Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to eschew Julie Andrews' advice today and not start at the very beginning, but rather closer to the end. Um, and as a result, I'd like you to consider a number of scenarios for the outcome that seem, uh, for, for the outcome of the 2016 election. Feel free to mentally tick off one of the boxes for the scenario that seems the most likely one to you. Also keep in mind as we go through the list that there are quite a number of asterisks attached to each of the scenarios I'm going to set out. The first scenario is that Malcolm Turnbull goes to a double dissolution election and wins a thumping majority in the House of Representatives and a workable Senate, though not necessarily a Senate majority in the coalition's own right. The second scenario is that Malcolm Turnbull goes to a double dissolution election and wins, but loses 10 seats in the House, giving him a majority of just four. The third scenario is Malcolm Turnbull goes to a double dissolution election and loses 15 seats and majority government, but has the prospect of forming a minority government with one or more independents in the House of Representatives. The fourth scenario is that Malcolm Turnbull goes to a double dissolution election and Labor wins 18 seats, giving it 73 seats, and is also in close enough range to bargain with independents to form minority government. Finally, the fifth scenario is that Malcolm Turnbull goes to a double dissolution election and, in one of the biggest political upsets of recent years, wins 21 seats, enough to form government in its own right. The asterisks, that is the many variables I mentioned earlier, that have to be added to uh, these scenarios include the question of whether we will indeed have a double dissolution election and what happens to the existing independents, which I presume for purposes of some clarity stay in their current numbers and three, what happens in the Senate afterwards. I put these scenarios out there at the beginning of my talk because in all the conversations about politics and the quality of governance these days, we often don't actually confront the brutal realities of what might await us down the track. We might talk about the government winning or losing an election, but we don't think what this might mean in practical terms. To give you some basis against which to decide which one of those boxes to tick, if an election were to be held today, based on the national trend in recent polls, a 3.5% swing against the government would see the coalition win just 74 seats in its own right, too short of the clear majority, presuming five seats stay independent. Labor would win 71 seats and be within range of forming a minority government too. The independents, just to remind you, are Andrew Wilkie, Bob Catter, Clive Palmer, Adam Bant, from the Greens and Cathy McGowan in Indi. Yet, even with the narrowing polls, both sides of politics have been operating in the period since Malcolm Turnbull's rise to the Prime Ministership on the implicit presumption that whatever happens, the coalition will win the election. This presumption is so firmly entrenched that it affects the way both sides of politics have been behaving. For example, there's been considerable grumpiness in the Labor Party that some people don't seem to be trying hard enough because they presume Bill Shorten will lead them to a loss and they don't want to affect their own chances of replacing him as a leader afterwards. On the coalition side, as we, have, uh, as we have observed over the past week, the presumption has clearly been that the government would be returned, for that could be the only explanation of the bad behaviour of some of its members, the spectacular displays of disunity, the rioting over policies not yet announced. We have to presume that the coalition really doesn't believe it can lose, because the alternative is to think that they don't care if they lose, which goes against compelling logic of self-interest. By week's end, members of the Liberal Party, both those in the Parliament and lay members, were expressing their anger and horror at the, uh, the damage Tony Abbott was doing. Abbott himself was forced to come out and say that, of course, he supported the return of a Turnbull government. But the point here is that it is not just Tony Abbott or even his supporters who have been behaving badly of late. We may come back to this later. But let's consider this presumption of a coalition victory in 2016 a little more. Until recently, you can understand why this presumption was so embedded as not even to be really worth discussing. There was immense goodwill across the political spectrum for Malcolm Turnbull that was not even particularly personally based, just a desperate nation hoping that a change of leadership would stop the previous chaos. On a leader-to-leader -leader basis, Turnbull is up against Bill Shorten, the nuggety political warrior who is probably the only person in the country who has firmly believed from the outset that he had a chance of winning this year's election. Unfortunately, the electorate took a rather dim view of the opposition leader early on and has not shown much of a dispensation to change it. 
Let's face it, most people have trouble remembering anything Bill has said in the last 12 months. Even as the gloss has come off Malcolm Turnbull in voters' minds, Shorten has not picked up as much as he would like. And of course, there is the double-headed issue of a first-term government. Australian political tradition says that the, a first term of government is never, that it says that a first term government is never voted out of office, though it was a close run thing in 2010. Popular translations of why this has been the case is that voters uh, want to give people enough time to prove themselves, or alternatively, they don't want to admit that they were wrong in the first place. But there's a double whammy when considering the 2016 election. It's not just that the coalition is a first-term government, it's that voters were so hostile to the Labor government before it. Despite the coalition's best attempts to show themselves just as incompetent and just as divided, brand Labor is badly sullied. So on the base of, basis of an unpopular opposition leader, the historical record that first-term governments tend not to get thrown out, and Malcolm Turnbull's still strong but fading popularity with voters, the election result has been regarded in Canberra as pretty clear cut. But now, running against that presumption is a, spectacular, is a specter of spectacular disunity within the government, a lack of coherent policy direction and perceptions of both weakness and indecision, and disappointment with Turnbull on both the left and the right. In normal circumstances, this would make people a lot more uncertain about the result. Let's now consider all the important numbers with which the parties go into the election. Redistributions have already notionally cost the coalition two seats, down from 90 seats to 88. On the other hand, redistributions have halved the number of highly marginal seats the coalition has to defend from 10 to 5. Labor needs to achieve a uniform swing of 4.5% to win government in its own right, and as I mentioned earlier, the swing at the moment is 3.5%. The distribution and performance of state governments around the country is expected to favour Labor in Queensland, known in the trade as a key battleground, but work against it in New South Wales. Weak candidates, historically low representation, bad local conditions and or scandals make Labor optimistic it can win up to 11 seats in Queensland. Sorry, it's a bit hilarious there. Um, but of this list, it seems to me that only uh, Petri, Capricornia and Herbert, and perhaps a couple of others, are seriously in contention. Others are a much bigger risk. Labor also thinks it has a chance of winning seats on the New South Wales Central Coast, and it's an astonishing uh, 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 coincidence that the Prime Minister was up there just in the last few days, and nominates one or two seats elsewhere around the con country. But the goal of 21 seats would appear to me a very courageous one. Despite events of recent weeks, the leadership contest, contest remains skewed in the coalition's favour, given P Bill Shorten's poor standing with voters. Now, let's talk about the asterisks a bit further. A double dissolution election and the Senate. The first and third presumptions, common to all the scenarios I outlined earlier, was that there would be a double dissolution election. That effectively means an election on July 2, called the day after the budget in May as currently scheduled, unless the government further pursues an option it has been considering of bringing forward the budget by a week. And it's worth noting that in some comments that uh, Malcolm Turnbull's made in the last couple of hours, his only uh, commitment is to have a budget in May. There seems to be a disturbing lack of detail around Parliament House how, about how you could actually make that work. That is, um, a, an election called the day after, uh, after the currently scheduled budget. Uh, in the sense of ensuring there was enough funding to keep the government going over the election period. One plan was to have an economic statement early, effectively within the next month, to lay out mandate issues uh, built around tax, so that at budget time you would only have to pass what used to be known as supply. That's still possible. The options here are that the government announces a very official sounding economic statement to the parliament in the last scheduled week sitting before the budget, which is next week, or that it outlines a package of tax changes in April when Parliament is not sitting. With so much fragility in the party room, either option looks increasingly difficult at the moment. Bringing forward the budget by a week would effectively mean announcing the election date. But I don't know how many of us are actually guessing on that these days. But it would give the coalition a few sitting days to get bills passed to keep the government running and have one more attempt to get the bill to reinstate the Australian Building and Construction Commission passed by the Senate. 
it has become the overwhelming expectation of everyone in the Parliament House that we will have a double dissolution election for a number of reasons. The first is that having got Senate voting reforms through the Parliament, a government would be mad not to use them to change the makeup of the existing Senate with which it has not been very successfully working. Think of it this way, you have a choice of seeking to win office in the House of Representatives, but you still face the same Senate after the election, or you take your chances on getting a more workable Senate. That doesn't just mean getting rid of the crossbench, it potentially means getting better numbers in your own right. Even here, though, there is a problem for Malcolm Turnbull. Presuming that recent events suggest the best he can now hope for is to be returned with a loss of some seats, not an emphatic win that will reinforce his electoral popularity, he potentially faces the spectre of more Liberal senators. Now that might, on the surface of things, appear to be a good thing. Except if his authority in the House is not that strong, the Senate could become another, even bigger headache. Remember how the then Senator Barnaby Joyce effectively became the balance of power senator after the 2004 election. There are other reasons why MPs think Malcolm Turnbull will go to the polls in July, and most of them revolve um, around the spectre of more weeks of parliamentary unhappiness in the coalition. That's not to say that if things go even more pear-shaped, it may seem to the Prime Minister that he actually gained some advantage in waiting to go to a normal House of Reps plus half Senate poll. Or it may just be that the logistics of pulling off a double dissolution election really are just too difficult. Whether Malcolm Turnbull opts for a double dissolution election or a normal election, his message will be the same. Who do you most trust to handle the economic transition from the resources boom? However, as the months have gone by, his scope for carving out an ambitious mandate of policy initiatives has gradually been whittled away. He's hemmed in on social policy by his conservative flank. He's allowed himself to be increasingly hemmed in on economic policy by his party room. Voters will be entitled to ask themselves, what is the point of Malcolm Turnbull? The point, of course, will be that, at best, he is seen as a better alternative than Labor and Bill Shorten. Whether you like Labor's policies or not, or whether you like Bill Shorten or not, the opposition has produced a more coherent set of policies and, and proposals that all seem to be a piece of a particular philosophical view. Labor hasn't panicked when their policies have been attacked, and they have appeared cohesive, even if there is plenty of private ambivalence towards Bill Shorten's leadership. On the other hand, Labor has left itself open to, uh, to potentially be exposed to a big scare campaign on issues like negative gearing and changes to superannuation concessions. The more the government panics, the more likely we are to see a campaign built on an attack on such policies. But we should keep in mind that the prospect remains for Labor to use some of the revenue it is planning to raise from such measures for tax cuts. Where does all this leave us average voters in terms uh, where does all this leave average voters in terms of the outlook for the 2016 election? Of the five scenarios I set out the, at the beginning, you would have to regard a thumping win by either side as the less likely of the various options as things currently stand. That means, depressingly, that we go into this election with the pro prospect of it producing continuing uncertainty, that the chances we end up with an extremely close result, which robs the Prime Minister of a electoral mandate, um, or, or even the possibility of mi minority government returning, are the most likely of all options. Equally depressing is the fact that you might have noticed that policy has not got much of a gallop in my outlook for politics in 2016. Malcolm Turnbull's internal policy constraints suggest his capacity to seek a broad mandate remain very limited. For the election campaign, that suggests the government will have to focus on negative campaigning against Labor, even if the opposition runs on a much more positive policy platform. For the period beyond, it does not encourage you to think we are going to face a period of transformative politics. There does remain, however, the slim prospect that Malcolm Turnbull, who it should be remembered has been a risk taker rather than a man of caution throughout his life, pulls something out of the policy bag during the campaign itself, possibly hijacking his party to do so, to reclaim his own political persona. This will perhaps be the most intriguing thing to watch for in the 2016 election campaign. Thank you.